in our next chapter, we cover Latin America. Latin America covers many of the Spanish-speaking countries south of the United States, not including the Caribbean, such as Puerto Rico, which you know, technically isn't a country, it's rather a commonwealth, Dominican Republic, Cuba, and some of these other countries here. But it extends from Mexico all the way down to southern Chile here. And here's a map of it. You notice it doesn't include this country right here, Belize, the Caribbean, and these three countries here, Guyana, French Guyana, which belongs to France, and Suriname. You can see the Rio de la Plata, which separates Uruguay and Argentina. Here's some satellite imagery because a lot of times Europe sends their um, space launch, it has their uh, launching facilities in, I believe it's French Guyana, and there's some places in Brazil because it's closer to the, to the equator. And you can see the mega cities that go around the periphery of South America. And then, of course, you can see Mexico City here. You can see places like Lima, Bogota, of course, Mexico City, Buenos Aires, Sao Paulo, Rio, up and down the coast here. So we'll talk about and refer to that term later, megacities. You can see La Paz, Bolivia, which is one of the two landlocked countries in South America. But Latin America is composed of about 17 countries shares a history of Iberian colonization. Iberian refers to the countries of Portugal and Spain. It contains about 600 million people, so a little bit less than 10% of the world's population. There's more than 200 million in Brazil. There's about 128 million in Mexico. When we talk about the neotropical diversity, one of the big issues, environmental issues, especially facing Latin America, is that issues, especially in Mexico, issues of air quality, water quality, and subsistence. Actually, the actual country or the actual city sinking because of, because of the weight of, weight, weight of Mexico City in that valley. Other issues we deal with deforestation, especially in places such as the Amazon, and the loss of what we call biodiversity. 6% um, of the Earth's land mass in terms of tropical rainforest have 50% of the world's species. And that turns into things like uh, chemical fertilizer, soil erosion, some of the things we've alluded to before. So you can see the Amazon rainforest here. And in the middle of Amazon, it does extend into, you know, briefly into, you know, Colombia. But when we talk about the Amazon, we're mainly talking about Brazil. But we talk about, so these are some of the environmental issues. We have po coastal pollution. If we remember the 2016 Rio Olympics coastal pollution with you know, swimming events or open water swimming rather and, and sailing was a concern and then some of these polluted rivers you can see this is the Brazilian state a, a Brazilian state where they're clearing a, uh, this is along the Amazon and then other things like environmental uh, challenges and we'll refer to those later and then some of the physical regions that we do have. We have the, the Western Mountains and the Eastern Shields. We've got the Andes, which run pretty much up the spine of South America. And then we've got the Shields, the uh, large upland areas of exposed crystalline rock. And then you can see a map here of South America. So we've got the separation, the boundary between the South American plate and the Nazca plate, where it meets up here with the Caribbean plate. So we've got a lot of volcanic and tectonic activity in Mexico, Chile, Peru, Colombia, not as much over in Brazil. And you can see down in the south here, the far south, we have glaciers and what we call Tierra del Fuego. This is in Patagonia. This is a sparsely populated area in, so in southern Argentina. So we have places like the uh, Orinoco in the northern, uh, northern part of South America, the Plata Basin, Rio de la Plata, and the Amazon. It's the largest river system by volume, but the second in length for the Nile. And you can see some of the environmental geography and the physical issues that they deal with. Drought, El Nino, um, altitudinal zonation, because we do have stark temperature changes. So it has a number of different zones as you move further and further up. And you can see some of the climate regimes here. A lot of these are going to be your A's, you know, tropical wet. We don't even get down to any of the D's like we do see in Canada and we'll look at in Russia.
what we've got our highlands that run right along the, the spine right here. And we do have some highlands here up in Mexico City where uh, mountains get really high. And these are we're fairly complex, but we can see you know, our, our desert-like conditions over here, and we'll refer to those at a much smaller scale, or larger scale, rather. Speaking of which, we have something called orographic precipitation. When we look at precipitation and something called relative humi humidity, it's um, specific humidity divided by the saturation humidity. And as rain moves up, the saturation, the ability for water to hold air, decreases. So at some point in time, it gets to 100% relative humidity, gets to 100% relative humidity, and eventually needs to precipitate, whether in the form of you know, sleet, snow, rain, or whatever here. So we have these rain shadows. Now, this is an example here in the Olympic Mountains and as we, as we look to the Columbia Plateau. But this, you can see the example here with the Andes Mountains right here. And then stuck inside of the Andes, we have some of these deserts, which receive very little precipitation. This is the rain shadow. So on the far side, Of the Andes Mountains. We've got this cold Antarctic current, which typically doesn't hold a lot of water to begin with. We have the Atacama Desert. And this is one of the driest places on the surface of the Earth. And you can see we're, we're kind of looking at this region right here. But you can see the rain shadow down here in Patagonia. Okay, as a result of this rain shadow effect from water and circulation patterns coming from the Southern Pacific Ocean and Antarctic. We can see uh, dangers posed by Hurricane Mitch in Central America. They don't get too much into South America here. This is Hurricane Mitch, and I think this was in the 90s. In 2012, I went on a cruise through Mexico and Central America, and we were diverted because one of the hurricanes there. And like I was talking about before, this is the alt altitudinal zonation. Cloud or montane forest, biota adopted by cooler, wetter climate conditions in the same relative latitude longitude, but changed slightly due to elevation. And these are mesas of islands influenced by cloud dynamics. Uh, most pronounced you see is Machu Picchu. Uh, and this is the administrative retreat and transfer station of the indigenous people. And you can see the relationship between the physical environment and this cultural connectivity here. And this is amazing. When we look at more cultural patterns and settlement patterns, we've got the Latin American city. It's a large concentration. These are typically what we call urban, uh, urban primacy or primate cities. It's a, basically a city that has three to four times larger than any other city in the country. A lot of times when we say Peru, we think Lima. When we think of Colombia, we say Bogota. Yeah, we say Chile, we say Santiago. We, we don't really know too many other cities because they're so much larger than those. So we have the Spanish dominance in Portuguese cultures. And we can see that the history of this, okay, talk about this Iberian colonization here. <coughs> Excuse me. You can see a dot density map of where people are. So we've got Montevideo, Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, around the kind of the periphery here. And it's for a variety of reasons. And of course, Mexico City. You can see an example of, of your typical South American city, but these, these change a lot. Okay, Lack of zoning laws, so in poor cities. You saw this at the Olympics with Rio de Janeiro. And then we see planned cities, such as Brasilia, who's moved inland to stimulate the economy inland from Rio de Janeiro and Buenos Aires, or Sao, Sao Paulo, I'm sorry, moved inland to serve as a capital. So this is a planned capital. It was the first planned capital in Latin America in 1956. There's other planned capitals. Believe it or not, Washington, D.C. was a planned capital. It was in the middle of the country at the time. Can Canberra is, is an example. Uh, New Zealand, uh, I'm sorry, Australia is an example of planned capital. And Abuja, Nigeria is an example of a planned capital. So you can see the migration of Latin America, this rural to urban within the region, and then you see this exodus to the Iberian Peninsula in Europe, or an exodus to 
North America. So you can see a lot of this inter and intra-regional migration. Uh, we've got rapid population growth, and a lot of that is due to, um, we do have declining fertility rates, but more importantly, or what contributes to that a lot more, is the decrease in crew death rates. We've had a lot of Chinese and Japanese between the 1870s and 1930s, so we see that's very big. And then we talk about languages, about two-thirds Spanish speakers, one-third Portuguese speakers. And we've got indigenous languages in your Central Andes, Mexico, Guatemala, and it's mainly Roman Catholic based on the predominance of um, from Portugal and Spain. And you can see some of the dominant languages here, you know, obviously Spanish and Portuguese, but like we have here in these maps, we do have some indigenous or local languages. And this is just a map, you know, this is just the graph of um, language, um, sorry, religion. Like we said before, the, uh, the Treaty of Tordesillas, uh, basically the Atlantic world was divided between Spain and Portugal. And I'll kind of look at a map of it here. So you can see the Portuguese influence here, and then pretty much the rest was Spain moving up into North America into the 1800s. This is the Latin American economy, you know, the cheap exports of raw natural resources, okay, in this Amazon area right here. And then the regional importance of agriculture. Other things about geopolitics, we've had insurgencies, drug traffickers. We heard about those um, in the 80s with, with the country of Colombia, drug cartels. And we still see a, a lot of this uh, related to drugs, especially in, in Mexico and in other countries in South America. We do have some extreme poverty. There's some definite de developmental challenges with industrialization. We have the Mexican assembly plants lining the U.S. border because, you know, labor there is cheaper than the United States just across the border. You know, there are lower wages, so we do have job loss in the United States due to that. So Latin America looks to attract foreign countries and be a player, you know, because they're outside of that, you know, quote-unquote, you know, periphery that we, we will refer to. But we do have some major mining and forestry, such as silver, zinc, copper, um, Mexico, Venezuela, and Ecuador export oil, and of course logging that we've referred to before. These are just some of the decrease in the average number of births per, per women, and that's still going down, but we still have really high birth rates in places like Belize, um, Honduras, Nicaragua, and you know, decreasing death rates, so we still have really high rates of natural increase. Um, illiteracy rates, really high um, very low illiteracy rates, and we're looking at a trend towards smaller families. And that's about it for Latin America.